only thing we can be sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. Five, four, three, two, one. Hello out there, everybody listening to the Into the Impossible podcast, the production of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. I am your fearful host in these fearful times, Brian Keating, and today I'm joined with a friend and a fellow astrophysicist, uh, Dr. Mario Livio, who is the author of many books. We're going to talk about his newest book in particular, which is called Galileo and the Science Deniers. I want to give a quick uh, a bio of Dr. Livio. Uh, who is known for many, many books, but he's also known as an internationally uh, famous and renowned astrophysicist. He's a best-selling author and popular speaker who worked for 24 years with the Hubble Space Telescope. He's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, he has written six previous books to this one on Galileo, and more than 400 scientific articles. He's appeared on 60 Minutes, Nova, and even The Daily Show, and he's lectured all around the world, literally, including here in San Diego. And we'll get back to that in a little bit. Uh, and he has a very widely watched TEDx talk called TEDx Mid-Atlantic, uh, which was uh, associated with one of his books from, I think it was 20, 2012, when I saw that video. He lives in Baltimore, Maryland. And he, like I, you know, have uh, a fascination with the great maestro Galileo Galilei. And behind me, you'll probably be able to describe this better than I can, uh, Mario. First of all, how are you doing in this uh, in these unusual times? Yeah, well, you know, I'm sheltering in place at my home, uh, not going anywhere, <laughs> <laughs> just just doing some short walks around the house um, for a long time already. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, Maryland, where I live. Uh, is still, uh, you know, it's we're, we're not yet uh, opening up. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. one of those states that is not opening up yet. So uh, the first thing I wanted to talk about, as I usually do with, uh, with guests that are authors, not all the guests on the Into the Impossible podcast are authors, but since you are many books of great renown, I want to start off with the cover of the book. As, as they say, you know, don't judge a book by their covers. Don't judge a book by its cover. But I always judge books by their covers. I, I really, uh, <laughs> I know how much thought and intensity goes into the creation of a cover from firsthand experience. So can you walk the audience through the choice of the cover design? We'll put up a picture of it. And, uh, and even the title of the book. Let's start there. Yeah. So, well, the title, uh, you see, this is a biography of Galileo, but because Galileo had to deal with uh, all kinds of science deniers, and because science denialism is, the way I see it, a big problem today, uh, then this is what determined the title, Galileo and the Science Deniers. Namely, it's a biography of Galileo, but with an eye on science denial today. So that's about the title. Uh, concerning the image, uh, on the cover, uh, so I chose uh, the very first portrait of Galileo uh, when he was relatively young, probably in his 40s. It was done by an unknown Tuscan painter, but it's the very first portrait known of him. Um, mm. Usually people, uh, you know, are familiar with pictures of him by Sustermans when he was old. Um, even there is one attributed to Tintoretto when he was sort of middle-aged. Uh, this one is, uh, is, is the earliest. So that's that. And then there are these, uh, uh, there is this figure of uh, orbits of planets uh, around the sun. And uh, the way the cover was chosen is that his picture is in the middle of that, which makes it look almost as if he is, uh, uh, in the bullseye of a target, uh, which kind of describes his life. Um, so, uh, so that's how the, that uh, cover was designed. <laughs> and of course, the uh, the deeper kind of perspective of the target of the bullseye that he lies at the center of is the Copernican 
construction of the cosmos. And obviously we'll get into that because it's a deeply intertwined with not only Galileo's scientific accomplishments, but also with his, uh, with his identity. I think his very identity psychologically was tied up along with the Copernican principle uh, that he, what we now call the Copernican principle. It really wasn't called that until I think the 1930s with, uh, with Bond and, and Go Tommy Gold and, and, and other people. Uh, but the, um, but the you know, Copernican dialogues and, and even his books, which tie nicely into your books as well, made me think that this is really a book about, uh, about controversies and curiosity. And it's, uh, it, it had nice uh, references to, not directly, but in my mind, it brought up your previous books, Brilliant Blunders, and, uh, and your more recent book, Why? Uh, what Makes Us Curious? And we'll get into those a little bit, because I do think there is sort of a theme that runs through those three books in particular, that I want to touch upon for the audience. I want to first begin with kind of a deeper picture of why we should have uh, academic freedom even, even at this day. Are, are we still kind of being threatened as academics? You're now emeritus professor, I understand, but, um, but is academic freedom relevant to today? I don't, I don't have the government telling me what I should research or what I shouldn't research or my dean or my chancellor. So can you talk about academic freedom? We, we discuss that quite frequently on this, on this very podcast. What does it mean to you and is it relevant today? Sure, let me just first make a small correction. I mean, I'm not formally an emeritus. I'm a retired professor. Retired, okay. But, uh, okay. Yes, <laughs> but I'm not an emeritus. Very busy, um, yes. Yes, now concerning um, the situation with, with academic freedom, um, you, you see the bigger question that I regard in, in this book in particular, but that always has been very close to my heart, is what I would call intellectual freedom. Mm -hmm. which is a, a little bit even more than academic freedom. I mean, it's not just, you know, your ability to research what you want and publish what you want and so on, but it is really, it, it ties into, into things even like freedom of speech, you know, that you should be entitled to your opinions too. Uh, and, and that's part of what I call your also intellectual freedom, and Galileo's fight was largely a fight for intellectual freedom. It is often described as if it was a clash between science and religion, which in fact it wasn't, and Galileo never saw it as such. Uh, it was, Galileo, you know, like all people at his age, were, was a religious person. Uh, his main point was that the Bible is not a science book. It was written for the salvation of humans and not to teach them science. He pointed out that, you know, in, in the case of astronomy, for example, the planets aren't even named in the Bible. And the language used, he said, was such that common people will be able to understand it. So basically, when science tells you something that appears to be contradictory to literal interpretations of biblical texts, you must change the interpretation. You must understand that that's not what the text meant. Because Galileo was convinced that actually the Bible cannot make any errors. It's just our interpretation that can be wrong. Um, so, so really it is this intellectual freedom, this idea that you should be able to research whatever you want, express whatever opinion you want uh, without any interference, be it from any type of officialdom, you know, no governments, no uh, religious institutions, none of those should interfere with your opinions, as long, of course, as your opinions don't harm anybody or don't incite others to harm somebody. Mm. Yes, I think, you know, that's been a theme for a few guests I've had on recently on the podcast, including Michael Shermer, who's a well-known skeptic, um, atheist, <coughs> and uh, but yet a valid and vigorous, vehement defender of free speech, even for people whose ideas he calls uh, devilish, and his new book is called Giving the Devil His Due, and it's about uh, the, the freedom to express ideas even when they're wrong. I'd like to talk a little bit about how uh, we we have in this book, you know, one main controversy at the time, which was, uh, of course, the Copernican versus the Aristotelian system. Can you explain for a little for the listeners that might not be familiar 
what uh, what is the difference between the system that Galileo promoted and the and the system that uh, seemingly the church and, and Pope Urban uh, later on famously went to uh, to defend so brutally in Galileo's case? Yeah, so you know the, the Aristotelian and the Ptolemaic, some, some, sometimes it's called system, yes, uh, was this geocentric system where the earth was at the center and the planets and the sun, uh, in this case, all revolved around the earth. Um, and, and that fit very nicely with the church's, Catholic church's thinking, because it basically put the earth and humans on earth at the center of the universe. Uh, so this is why it has been adopted for many centuries. The Copernican system, which is the one that Galileo adopted, uh, said that no, it's actually the sun is at the center and the planets, including the earth, uh, orbit the sun. And the earth is just another planet, just like the other planets, and, and they all orbit the sun. So this was the main difference. Mm. And so what I thought about as I was reading this is what would I, on the devil side, which is ironically the God side in this case, the opposite side to Galileo was, the, of course, the Catholic Church headed at the Vatican by the Pope, um, that, uh, you know, that we should sort of see it through their eyes, at least to understand why did they believe so vehemently in the position that they did. Uh, and I think a lot of it comes down to one of the things that we do here on the Arthur C. Clarke's uh, Center for Human Imagination on this Into the Impossible podcast is that scientific inquiry is the best method to go about getting truth, but sometimes it will be vehemently opposed by people who trust their senses. And I think Galileo uh, was kind of interesting to me because in many cases he let his own biases, so to speak, sneak in uh, to scientific arguments. And you, and you outlined four cases that he made um, uh, in favor of the Copernican principle, which is the heliocentric model of the world, which we now know to be correct. But I, I often point out, even to some of my college students, and I, I would expect it's true even in Johns Hopkins, and, and I know that for, for a fact, actually, but, but all around the world, even some you know, college students who are physics majors, if I ask them, uh, if I say to them, the world is, the uh, earth is at the center of the solar system, the sun goes around the earth, prove, to, prove me wrong. Uh, I know that uh, that's not the case, but but I think uh, it's very difficult for the average person, let alone uh, for a college student, let alone uh, a lay person who's not interested in science to prove many of these things. So they tend to take things based on their senses. And I think what Galileo did for the first time is give human beings extra sensory perception. Uh, and I want to walk us through what really kicked off this notion in his mind was the uh, pioneering use of the telescope. He didn't invent it contrary to popular myth uh, about him. He did many things, but he didn't invent the telescope. Uh, but maybe say what happened in the, um, in the summer, fall of, of 1609 through the winter of 1610 that really revolutionized Galileo's perspective on the universe. Yes. So, you know, it has been said that during those months that you now mentioned, uh, Galileo made more discoveries than almost any other person did in their entire lifetime. Um, so indeed, he did not invent uh, the telescope. The telescope was invented in the Netherlands. But as soon as he heard about this, he immediately started to construct his own telescopes. And very quickly, he constructed better telescopes than any ones that were available. I mean, the typical telescopes that were there uh, available you know, were a four power telescope and he constructed telescopes that were more than 20 power. So he had better telescopes than most. But first of all, you know, think about this. I mean, people got a telescope, what they would do in places like in the Venetian Republic, they would watch sea, uh, you know, the sea, ships at sea and things like this. Galileo had the idea of turning this to the heavens and, and looking at what he could see there. And he started by observing the moon. And he observed the moon and he saw features on the moon. But that's, this is the amazing part. That's where his artistic education came in. You see, because for example, the British astronomer Harriet also observed the moon and saw the same features that Galileo saw, but really couldn't understand them. And you know, just drew some very, very rough sketches from which you cannot understand anything. 
Galileo from his understanding of light and shadow and drawing, he was able to understand that what he's seeing is a very rugged surface with craters and mountains. And he, not only that, he drew them. You know, he, he had these wash drawings, which were fantastic of the surface of the moon. So already by that, he introduced something that is a huge step towards modern science. Because what that did, you see, until then, there was this feeling that things terrestrial and things celestial are very, very different. Things terrestrial, you know, they can get corrupted, they die, then this, in the heavens, everything is perfect. There are no blemishes, nothing. He showed, no, the surface of the moon is really very much like the surface of the earth. So already he introduced this unification of showing basically that things on earth and things in the heavens are very similar. Then, of course, he went and observed, let's say, you know, not necessarily in this order, but Jupiter, and found these four satellites of Jupiter, which today we call the Galilean satellites. This was, these were, first of all, the very first objects since antiquity newly discovered in the solar system. Second, this looked like a mini solar system in itself. You know, it had four objects revolving around Jupiter. He was actually able to determine the periods of revolution of these satellites to very high precision. But not only that, you see, some of the people who objected to the Earth moving around the sun said, yeah, well, if it's moving around the sun, how is it possible that it's not losing its moon, for example? And also, why is it the only planet that has a moon before, you know, he discovered that? What he did is, with his observation, he killed both of these objections. Because first of all, he discovered that other planets have moons. And second, you see, everybody agreed that Jupiter revolves around something, be it the Earth or the Sun. Well, the fact is, it revolves around something, and it's not losing four moons. So there is no problem for the Earth not to lose its moon. So this was the other thing. Then there was his observation of Venus. That was really, you know, like uh, almost like a last nail in the coffin of Aristotelianism, even though not fully, but, you know, to some extent. The thing is that Venus, because Venus, if Venus revolves around the sun, it means that there is one point when it is farthest from Earth, and then it should look smaller, smaller and fully lit. And there is a point where it is closest to Earth, namely between the Earth and the Sun, in which case it's the biggest and dark, basically, and show some crescent phases in between, really like the moon, like our own moon. And that what, was what was seen. While if Venus was orbiting the Earth, it should always appear as some sort of a crescent, but never full or, you know, or dark. So this was a very, very clear evidence that uh, Venus was orbiting the sun. Uh, he had other observations. I don't know if you want me to list them all. I mean, you know, he saw that there were many stars in the Milky Way. Uh, he followed the, the paths of sunspots on the surface of the sun and determined that they are on the surface of the sun and from that to determine that the sun spins around its axis, uh, which actually removed another objection to Copernicanism because they said, well, if the earth is moving, how come it's, it can move all the time and not stop? Well, here he found that the sun was also <laughs> moving, you know, or uh, spinning around its axis and not stopping and so on. So all these observations really added, all of them added something to this idea of uh, Copernicanism. Yes, of course, they, they added to it. Uh, to, again, I'm going to take the side of uh, the Pope, ironically, but, uh, but none of them were provative of this fact. In fact, it wasn't proven that the Earth truly goes around the sun and not the other way around. 
uh, for almost a century, right, until uh, the, st- the study of aberrations took over. Uh, but but I think you're you're absolutely right. Giving evidence is is incredibly important. One piece of evidence you left out uh, is, of course, the most interesting part to me from a psychological perspective. And I think this book is as much a psychological profile written from the perspective for the very first time. I believe your book is the first portrait of Galileo as a biography by an astronomer. I think is that correct? I mean, you're not a theologian. You're not a historian, but uh, but you're a world-renowned astrophysicist. I don't think we've had such a biography. Is that right? Uh, I, I think that that is true. At least none of the well-known biographies were written by by active astronomers or mm-hmm. astrophysicists. So the piece of evidence he left out was, of course, Galileo's uh, claim that the tides uh, that are caused in the oceans. Uh, were generated by this kind of sort of combined motion of revolution and rotation, rotation on its axis and revolution around the sun, both of which were essentially, you know, found to be heretical uh, at a time. Uh, we'll get we'll get a little bit more into that uh, when we discuss Galileo in uh, in the in the um, uh, the Dialogo, the dialogue on two. Uh, chief world systems, so so called, that got him into m- the most trouble. Uh, but let's go back to 1616, uh, when I find it so fascinating that I, I of course, knew that in 1616 he was really um, scolded and warned not to teach, you know, the, the heliocentric model. Uh, but what I found most interesting, just to be honest with you, Mario, was that. Uh, there were these Jesuits, there were these um, priests, and they were studying math and science. And um, I always say when I'm talking to a religious people, they say, you know, why do so many, um, you know, why are so many scientists atheists? And I say, well, why don't you know more about science than you actually do? And I think in the past, because I think it's a vehicle, if you believe, and, and your book doesn't make a case for atheism in any uh, sense of the word. But I think if you want to know more about the world, if you believe it was created, uh, then then it should impel you to learn more about the universe and know more about science. What do you make of the fact that in the 1600s, the early 1600s, there were so many Jesuits interested in astronomy? Was that merely to fend off attacks by people like Galileo and Bruno and, and others? No, I, I definitely don't think so. And, and, and this is why I say that it is a mistake to think that uh, the Galileo story is a clash between science and religion. Uh, the Catholic Church actually employed some of the best scientists of the time at the Collegio Romano, at this, you know, at the Roman College in Rome. Um, and so they were excellent mathematicians and very, very good scientists. Um, so what is true, however, uh, you know, one has to admit, is that a number of them still were unable to um, somehow isolate themselves from the teachings of of the church and uh, be completely open-minded about their scientific discoveries. Um, At least some of them, that that was the case. Or, Or maybe it was a matter of education and the way that they had been brought up and and things like that. because certainly, the, for example, they confirmed uh, the reality of Galileo's observations. Uh, you know, at first he had to fight to even convince people that what you see with the telescope represents a reality, and it, it's not some artifact of the, of the telescope. But they actually agreed that these were really the things that, that are out there and that you see with the, with the telescope. It was more the interpretation of the results where they had some trouble. And you you see, what happened is that uh, most of those Jesuits, while accepting all of Galileo's findings, uh, they somehow discovered a fallback position. There was this hybrid model of Tycho, or Tycho Brahe, as he's sometimes called, um, where... uh, you, you know, everything revolved uh, <laughs> around the sun except the earth, and the sun itself revolved around the earth. Uh, and uh, even with Galileo's observations, it was uh, virtually impossible to show that this model is wrong. Uh, but Galileo, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> had the opinion of, uh, of modern scientists who says, if you have two models that explain things equally well, you choose the simpler one. I mean, for him, 
uh, Bryce uh, model had, uh, you know, in, in our language, had too many moving parts. <laughs> and so he didn't accept that. But his observations could not quite argue against that, even though we know today that his observations of sunspots and the motion of sunspots actually could show conclusively that the Copernican model was correct, but that he, he didn't know that. Yeah, that was sort of a poetic justice, perhaps that it was uh, that it, it could have taken him uh, to a level of proof. But I, I doubt, given all the other evidence that he provided, uh, they also didn't know that his explanation for the tides was wrong. So I, I doubt, you know, I came away from the book doubting that if they had really appreciated or thought more about the sunspot evidence, which I think is very strong. Uh, that they would have been convinced by that if they weren't convinced by the other uh, observations that he that he employed. And again, you know, I think it's important to say what was he actually proving or disproving. I think he was merely with the observations, at least of the Medici satellites. Uh, he was very smart and cunning politically in some ways. Uh, he named the moons of Jupiter after his patrons, and I think yes. you know, we do that nowadays too with the Simons yes. with the Simons yes. Observatory, uh, <laughs> uh, et cetera. But um, but in reality, I think you know he he also was a victim. He you paint a portrait of him as a human being, which I think on many cases is very valid. And I've talked about this with other um, uh, with other guests that we when we portray somebody like an Einstein. And, uh, and uh, Stephen Hawking as a scientist. It's true. Uh, on the other hand, it kind of does a disservice because they're almost like otherworldly. And, and Galileo was, was kind of otherworldly when you look at his successes. But when you look at the scientist as a man or as a woman, uh, then you can, can realize that they have their own flaws. And, and none of this is to excuse the treatment of Galileo. But uh, can you say something about what you came away with um, in your impressions of Galileo as a human being? Uh, what vices, what what sorts of, of just normal human behavior. I, I always think of him as, you know, kind of this paragon of science, but like most scientists, he was susceptible to certain biases, uh, including those that were tightly wrapped up with his ego. So can right. you say something about him as a, as a human? Yeah, Galileo was really not the nicest person, I would say. Yeah. Uh, he was He was a real zealot. He, he was a zealot and he, uh, you know, he could be very nice to members of his own family. But boy, if you were against him, did he use a sharp pen against you? Uh, and he, he really, he, he, he never held back. <laughs> I mean, no one could criticize him and not, you know, feel his wrath. Uh, he, he, he was not the nicest person. He... Uh, he was also, um, you know, he had his own problems in his uh, personal life. You know, he never married the woman with whom he had his children. Mm -hmm. um, he uh, put two of his daughters in a convent. Um, and that was not so unusual at the time, except that I'm still a little bit puzzled by why didn't he put them in a somewhat better convent than the one he did put them in, even though that was convenient because it was not too far from his home in, in Archetri. Mm -hmm. um, so he did that. Um, he definitely was wrong. He was wrong a number of times. I mean, you mentioned the tides, his theory of the tides uh, was completely wrong. It, it, was, it was interesting because it had this mechanical aspect to it which you know was some of his trademark, and he he didn't like forces that acted across distance, uh, you know, like gravity, which you don't see. So in in that respect, it was an interesting theory, but it was completely wrong. Uh, he had a theory of comets, which was completely wrong. I mean, it had some interesting again elements to it, but it, it was wrong. I mean, he did not. They believe that these were real objects, you know, orbiting uh, the sun and so on. So he definitely was wrong on occasion. Um, he fought with equal strength when he was wrong as when he was right. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, and like I say, he wasn't the nicest person. However, I, I will still say uh, his fight for intellectual freedom 
was far beyond, you know, just trying to be right. I mean, when you read what he wrote, uh, you know, about not interpreting the Bible as a science book, I mean, that is just so convincing, especially to somebody reading it today. But, but his point was always so well taken in that. And his language was incredible because he, he was first in, in poetry and, you know, in, in, in the arts. Uh, so he, he could write well. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, but at the same time, he was extremely sarcastic uh, on many occasions, uh, sometimes rightfully so, sometimes somewhat less rightfully so. Um, so he definitely was a human being. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he, for a while, drank a lot, uh, enjoyed women quite a bit. Um, and, uh, yeah, and, and, and of course, in his interaction with the church, um, he appeared to be not always completely truthful uh, in the sense that uh, clearly he was very frightened, especially at old age. He was afraid of being tortured. Uh, He was well aware of what happened to Giordano Bruno, who was burnt at the stake. Um, And uh, he he was really fearful. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the church had, you know, this kind of authoritarian power over the affairs of of people uh, throughout the lands of Italy that they influenced. You make the point that he made a very uh, poor decision in retrospect to kind of leave the Venetian Paduan kind of right. sphere of influence and move to move to Florence to avoid teaching. Now I'll do anything to get out of teaching, but uh, I don't think I want to get my books on the index or you know get uh, get uh, threatened with torture. Let me, as I did with Galileo, let me uh, ask the kind of other side of the coin, and again acting as the devil but defending the Pope or the opposite side of Galileo. Um, you know what what should the Pope have made again back then? Even even advanced, sophisticated colleagues, or not, I won't say colleagues, they were actually enemies of Galileo in, in some sense, but people like Copernicus and, and others, Tycho Brahe, they had, you know, con- uh, ideas of the universe that we would say are really, you know, are completely wrong. Aristotle, of course, be, you know, being being among them, Ptolemy, etc. cetera. Are, are they deniers? I mean, were you worried about using the term denier? Whenever I see it, you know, I read a book as uh, for Physics Today as a, as a book review, uh, uh, called um, The Number of the Heavens by Tom Siegfried. And he really talks about the multiverse. And in it, I criticize him for using the term denier. He calls it multiverse deniers like uh, Paul Steinhardt or other people. Um, I found it a very charged term. I, I, you know, I feel some, some terms should be used for real, you know, awful, uh, awful intellectual oversights, uh, such as denying the Holocaust, or perhaps, uh, you know, climate change, as you make in this case, even though I don't think those are equivalent either. Were you worried about that? Uh, I mean, uh, using such a such a potentially loaded term that maybe some listeners might might be uh, put off by? Um, no, I, I wasn't worried. But I will say that there is no doubt that using that term, um, was influenced by the fact that I was so alarmed by science denial today. Mm. Uh, truly alarmed, mm-hmm. and 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 as you can see through the book, throughout the book, uh, it's a biography of Galileo, but constantly with an eye on what's happening today. Uh, and 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 those were things that that true are, are really troublesome and. It's mainly troublesome. Uh, look, I mean, it's one thing if people, uh, you know, still believe, let's say, in creationism instead of, let's say, uh, uh, you know, Darwinian evolution or something like that. Um, that, you know, I think is not a good idea and certainly it shouldn't be taught in science classes, uh, but it doesn't have an immediate effect on our lives. But when you have things such as climate change or how to treat the current COVID-19 pandemic, uh, and you have science denial in that case, so these are cases where people are betting against science while putting the future of life on Earth in danger. 
And I think that that is truly insane to do that. I mean, it's never a good idea to bet against science uh, because science has this uh, you know, wonderful ability to self-correct, even if it sometimes takes, takes time. So it, it's not that science is always right, but science does self-correct. Uh, and, and you, you know, I mean, for example, you know, people would say, oh, the initial models for COVID-19 uh, say that there will be 200,000 dead in the U.S. And now they say it's only 74,000 dead, you know, the models. They say, sure, because these are mathematical models and they rely on inputs that you put in from data. And as your data become better, then the models, you know, can change. This does not make them wrong. I mean, it's, it's, it's just... This is the way science really works. Uh, but science is a discipline where you can test things, where you can falsify things, which is extraordinarily important. Um, and so that was constantly on my mind when I wrote this book on Galileo. And the denial in his case, again, it's not the fact that people were religious. It is the fact that they couldn't accept the fact that interpretations of biblical texts could be wrong. Not that the Bible itself is wrong. The, the human interpretation of those texts could be wrong. This was Galileo's point. You know, he made it, again, in his usual sarcastic fashion. He said that he didn't believe that the same God who has given us our senses and reason wanted us to abandon their use. Uh, so, uh, you know, I mean, he said, when you have a conflict between what observations and reasoning tell you and interpretation of text, you should change the interpretation of the text. Mm -hmm. So another thing that struck me in the book is uh, Galileo as a, as a businessman, as a, as a head of an enterprise, a CEO of an industry, Galileo Incorporated. Um, uh, my uh, friend and uh, we, we did an, uh, an event together at UCSD on the, uh, in 2010 on the 400th anniversary of the publication of Sidereus Nuncius, uh, Mario Biagioli. Uh, he basically makes a very convincing case in his book, uh, Galileo's Instruments of Credit, that you know what Galileo wanted to do was kind of two things that were almost at odds with each other. He wanted to uh, attain you know prestige, fame, uh, make more money, have more influence, but he also wanted to avoid uh, attention, you know, sort of from the uh, people that were potentially would view his findings with suspicion. I, I think it's impossible to say that he wasn't warned, you know, and didn't know. And you, you make this case in in the book where you kind of go back and he and, and you make the case that in the famous trial of 1634 uh, that he believed, you know, he would make statements that seemed to like reject the Copernican theory or argue on behalf of, uh, of the, the uh, Pope Urban's view, for example. And I think, um, you know, what's so interesting about when you say we should believe in science, I, I, you and I are both scientists. I mean, we know that scientists are human. We know that scientists make mistakes. I think in this case, it's uh, scientists have a, a propensity that is good to be anti-authority and that we shouldn't look to authority for the answer. Einstein, as you point out, and, and many other scientists, uh, and Darwin as well, uh, in Brilliant Blunders, you point out that they make mistakes and that, and that did a very good uh, uh, um, service by showing scientists as human beings. And, uh, and so I think it's, it's very interesting that Galileo had this dual mandate and he was extremely, he reminds me of like a hermit crab or one of those fiddler crabs that you see on the beach here sometimes in San Diego or maybe in Baltimore before you eat them in the crab, uh, crab district. But these fiddler crabs that are really extremely well developed on one side of their claw and the other side is like atrophy. They never use it. I, I don't know why genetic or not genetically, but biologically that is the case. But it seems like he was incredibly brilliant when it came to uh, scientific matters and even cultivating a monopoly on his telescope. I mean, he wouldn't even share it with Tycho, uh, with um, Kepler, right? But on the other hand, he was incredibly impolitic. He didn't seem to understand the way that his uh, ideas and his message could be crafted. You go through the episode of 
the dialogue. We'll turn to that now, uh, where uh, his famous book on the two different systems of the world, written in this um, this exchange over four days, is a dialogue, and he puts the words uh, of the Pope namely Aristotelianism, into the mouth of a character named Simplicio. Can you talk a little bit about Simplicio and his psychological ma- motives in that book? Yes. So, so in that book, he, he, it's a conversation between uh, among three people. Uh, one uh, plays the role of Galileo himself. Uh, one plays the role of an Aristotelian. And one plays the role of an educated but non-scientist who listens to the other two. Um, so the guy who plays Galileo basically argues for the Copernican system. Uh, the guy, Simplicio, Simplicio, who uh, uh, the name is coined after a known Aristotelian supporter, but also has a connotation of being a simpleton. Um, uh, he plays the role, uh, he, he talks about the, the Aristotelian system. And the educated person is, uh, is named after a personal friend of Galileo. Um, and for anybody who reads that book, uh, it is easy to see that Galileo more or less ridicules uh, Simplicio and, uh, you know, and his ideas uh, about uh, you know, a, a geocentric model. Um, but... Galileo also knew that he will not get permission to publish uh, the, the book uh, in this way. Uh, and well, I don't know if he knew that, but it was pointed out to him by his friends. And, and so he added the preface and the coda in which he more or less said, oh, well, actually, it's all, uh, you know, just a model in a way. And uh, it's inconclusive at the end. Uh, the problem was that, again, anybody who read the book wasn't particularly convinced by the preface and the, and the conclusion or the coda. They, they did look like an afterthought. Uh, and consequently, you know, he was eventually put on trial. Uh, but uh, so he wasn't politically smart in that way. but. You know, I, I like to think that he was also at some level naive because he, he, had, he had a great opinion of himself and justifiably so in the sense that he was very, very smart and his arguments, you know, against literal interpretations were extremely powerful. So he felt, I think, that once he puts, you know, this caveat at the beginning and at the end, that is enough. And the fact is, believe it or not, that, you know, when Pio Paschini, who was this person who was asked uh, in the middle of the 20th century uh, to write a biography of Galileo, and he was the person of the church asked by the church to write that biography, he basically (laughs) concluded that Galileo was fair, and it was not his fault that the Copernican argument was much stronger than the Aristotelian one. Uh, And, uh, you know, it's telling that the church actually prohibited the publication of Pio Paschini's book, even though they ordered it. Mm. Uh, That's really fascinating. Um, it's, It's funny to think about how yeah, you know, time and time again, history, as Mark Twain said, doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And towards the end of the, again, as I said before, we went onto live recording this. I said to you offline, you know, I don't like to give away the whole book because I want people to read this book. It reads, uh, it reads so interestingly. It's it's a work of of nonfiction. It's a work of science, science biography, and it's written by an, a professional uh, astrophysicist, one of the greatest to use, although you haven't used many refractors as far as I know. I've used more refractors than you have, I think. <laughs> well, I'm a theorist. You, 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 you are an observer. <laughs> yeah, but you use the Hubble telescope and you've made my, you know, major discoveries um, uh, throughout your, throughout your uh, storied career. So um, I want to turn to back to the Pope again. I, I, I just think it's, it's more interesting if I kind of take a little bit of a, of a not a gentle adversarial discussion. 
But uh, the thing that, you know, that I kept thinking about is what if you, Mario Olivio, what if you're uh, emperor of the planet and you're astronomers and you support your National Science Foundation so heavily that you've got the greatest telescopes in the world and your, uh, your planetary astronomers, they discover an asteroid and the asteroid is coming right towards the Earth. And it's going to hit the Earth, and um, with a zero uh, percent chance of missing the Earth, it's going to devastate all of life on Earth. What would you do? Do you have an obligation to keep the peace, even if it means um, not lying uh, through, oh, you know, commission, but lying through omission, perhaps? What would you do as you know, Emperor Pope uh, Mario Livio? Uh, I don't know. That's that's a hard question. I, uh, I I'm not sure if to understand your question in the way that there is nothing I can do to actually stop it from- Yeah, there's nothing you can do. That's that, uh, What I'm getting at is, does a government or the papacy back in the 17th century, do they have an obligation to kind of keep the peace? Is there an obligation to avoid panic? Uh, even if we know it's inevitable, or even if the science is not decidable at, with the instruments and, and knowledge of that time, is there, you know, should they have, was it so bad of them to keep, to try to keep the peace Obviously, I don't believe this, but I'm just kind of making this devil's advocate position for you to consider. What obligations did the Pope have? I mean, what if this got out? Could it be dangerous? Could it undermine uh, the entire uh, credulity in the in the biblical narrative, for example? Yeah. Well, I, I still think that in, in that case, uh, the actions of the Pope did not come from that type of motivation. It came from type of motivations that, yes, there was... Already, you know, the Thirty Years' War. Uh, so there were there was a clash between Protestants and Catholics uh, that the Pope was very aware of. Uh, there were problems that the Pope was having internally because this particular Pope, Urban VIII, uh, spent money like there was no tomorrow. Uh, there was nepotism that he appointed his uh, his nephews to various positions and so on. And his, so his entire attitude uh, was really more of a person who felt personally, um, you know, under pressure. And not because, you know, he necessarily believed that this is the best course for Christianity or humanity. Uh, I, I don't think that he did that. Um, you know, concerning... Should one keep the peace if an asteroid is about uh, to destroy Earth without any uh, without any possibility to avoid that? Um, I don't know. I don't think one should keep quiet about that. Uh, in the same way that I don't think anybody should have t said, um, you know, that uh, when the current pandemic started, that. Uh, oh, there are now only 15 cases and very soon it will be down to zero. Uh, you know, when all scientists were saying exactly the opposite. Uh, so I, I, I don't think that this is a good strategy. I think that uh, telling the truth, even in difficult times, um, is, uh, is pretty essential. I mean, yes, one can encourage people. You know, I mean, you know, during World War II, you know, Churchill famously, you know, said, we'll fight them on the beaches, we'll fight them in the streets. I mean, he did not say, oh, oh no, they are never going to come here and nothing is going to happen, you know, and so on. He basically said, look, it's really bad and we will have to do everything we can to fight them. Um, so, so I think, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that's my opinion. So I want to talk now, uh, I'm going to stop being a devil now. Um, uh, at least for the time being. I want to talk about uh, Galileo's, the end of his, his life. Obviously, the story that you recount of his trial uh, is incredibly gripping, and much has been made of it in, in, the, in the media, and even in the press, and even the, the not pardoned, technically, I don't think the Pope uh, John Paul II pardoned Galileo in 1992, but, uh, but, but instead, kind of the aftermath of the affair uh, again, I want people to read the book. So I'm, I'm showing now on the back of my screen uh, some scenes that I took from Archetri, which is the final uh, home house imprisonment that Galileo enjoyed. I put enjoyed in quotes, although I do think 
you know, if you have to be at home in prison, we, we ran a conference there in 2015 on the subject of testing relativity. Uh, and of course, you make the point in here, Galileo was one of the first, if not the first, to consider what is meant by relativity, so much so the relative motions of objects and their behaviors, so much so that uh, Einstein, uh, in, his, uh, in one of his books, in his works, he cited Galileo as really the originator of this idea of the principle of relative motion. Now, Galileo was imprisoned here uh, beginning in 1634 until his death in uh, 1642, I think, so eight, yes. eight, eight or so years. Uh, the Pope was not, uh, he seemed like a real difficult uh, person. He was very, it seemed tyrannical, oppressive, almost vindictive in many cases, but he did allow him to live in this rather sumptuous villa, which we, as I said, I had a conference there. I spent three days in the villa. Uh, we lived near it and uh, ate there every day. And beside from, aside from hiding my head on the ceiling, because the ceilings are very low there, because people's heights back then, including Galileo's, were kind of a, a good 10, 15 centimeters shorter than I am, uh, it didn't seem that bad. So uh, was good. did the Pope do him, uh, sort of give him any special kindness, or was that just sort of an accident uh, that he was allowed to live both near his, his daughter, uh, Celesta, the sister, Mar uh, Maria Celesta, um, I don't know if his other daughter was at the same convent, but you can see it here, I think, in she the background. Was, she was. Yeah. yeah so she talk was. about, you know, uh, if he wasn't treated like, you know, uh, Jeffrey Epstein. I mean, he was he was put into a pretty decent uh, uh, arrangement. He was essentially under house house arrest. And, um, you know, as I say, this, this, the surroundings are, are pretty nice. So what was life like for him in imprisonment? He did write more books after he was in prison. Correct. He, he wrote a, a very important book that described all his experiments in mechanics and yes. all his ideas. In yeah, mechanics. we'll get to that. Yeah, we'll talk about well, the discourse. Mm -hmm. Yes. But, um, uh, well, look, Galileo was uh, probably the best known scientist in Europe. And he actually was a personal friend of the Pope before he wrote the Dialogo. Mm -hmm. um, so... Uh, it was quite, and he was also old. He was, you know, already in the 70s. So he was already quite old. Um, so there was no question that he would really be put to torture. Mm. Uh, uh, and in addition, there are some speculations that maybe uh, there was even some sort of a plea bargain during the, the trial, uh, which, uh, you know, he confessed and, uh, you know, did his abjuration. And uh, as a result of that, uh, he was given a somewhat uh, more lenient treatment and, uh, you know, more, uh, a, a, a not so severe a punishment. Mm. Uh, but, but the punishment was still there. I mean, he was on house arrest for, you know, eight and a half years or so. Um, and... Uh, you know, there were lots of restrictions. There were, he could get visitors, but he couldn't get many visitors. He couldn't discuss many things. Um, even when he died, um, they wanted to, to do a big, uh, you know, tomb for him and the Pope objected to that. Uh, they still didn't allow him to, to publish more books. In fact, even the printing of his previous books was disallowed in Italy. Mm. Mm. So, 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 so it's not that he wasn't punished. He was punished, um, but yeah, he wasn't burnt at the stake and uh, and wasn't yeah. put to <laughs> torture. So behind but me now the, is it, yeah. Go ahead. The humiliation he had to go through, mm. by, you know, by giving his abjuration on his knees before the inquisitors you know, a person at 70 years old uh, was sufficient, I think. And, yeah. and mind you, he was never very healthy, too. I mean, he suffered from lots of illnesses throughout mm. most of his life. Yeah, and the story of his kind of uh, delay of, of uh, trial and is, is, is just so gripping. It reads like a, like a true um, courtroom drama, so you're to be commended as usual. I'm showing in the back for those of you watching on YouTube that you can see it, but some of the olive trees and the grape uh, trees that are in Galileo's villa, uh, is it Villa El Galoleo, um, and there's, uh, it's, it's, it's such a peaceful 
uh, genteel place to be. As I said, uh, it's much better than say what Bernie Madoff, quote unquote, uh, might be enjoying as we speak. Uh, just a quick note on his daughter. You know, a lot of books focus on Galileo um, or fo focus on scientists and their relationships with their fathers. I mean, my book sort of uh, covers that. Uh, what's so interesting in Davis Sobel, who endorsed your book, um, uh, saying uh, such lovely words as, every so often a reason arises to tell, retell the life of Galileo. This year, as Mario Livio so forcefully demonstrates in Galileo and the Science Deniers, the 400-year Galileo, uh, Galileo affair casts an urgent new light on the current climate crisis. That's Davis Sobel, author of Longitude, Galileo's daughter and the glass universe. And she wrote very tenderly about their relationship and how devastating it was for Galileo when he passed away. Um, what about that? Uh, you have daughters, if I remember. Uh, uh, yes, yes. What, uh, and I have daughters I too. I have two daughters and a son. Ah, uh, yes. So um, what, what was Gal like, Galileo like as a father, as a scientist father, uh, you know, to boot? He was, uh, his father uh, well, you know, had had high hopes for him. Un unfortunately, he let him down. He became a he became a, a, a you know a scientist, not a doctor. And uh, it reminds me of of Hubble. Uh, his father wanted him to become a lawyer. And you know, these great scientists, uh, you know, renowned for their use of the telescopes, uh, defied their fathers to go on to great uh, great accomplishments for all of humanity. But tell me a little bit about Galileo as a son. Uh, uh, and as a father, especially with his uh, with his uh, son Vincenzo and his daughter Celeste. Yeah. So uh, as a son, uh, you know, his father was a musician as, and a music theorist. Um, he almost certainly helped his uh, his father in experiments. Um, uh, his father Vincenzo was uh, was himself a very stubborn and uh, you know uh, not particularly uh, giving in to authority uh, person. And uh, he wrote a book against the musical theories of his own teacher in music. Uh, and uh, Galileo almost certainly uh, inherited some of this objection to authority from his father, no question about that. Um, concerning his daughter, so he had two daughters and a son. Uh, unfortunately, at the time, uh, there was a big difference between women and men in the sense that to marry a daughter, uh, you needed to have a dowry. And uh, because all his children were illegitimate, because he never married uh, the woman that was the mother of his children, um, the dowry for his daughters who were illegitimate daughters would have been just incredible and beyond his means. Uh, and as a result of that, he put them in the convent, which was not unusual at the time, like I said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, one of his daughters uh, never adjusted to, to the convent life, really. And we know almost nothing about her, except a little bit which we know from the letters of his other daughter. Uh, this daughter, Sister Maria Celeste, uh, she wrote to Galileo and, you know, more than a hundred of her letters survived. And uh, Dava Sobo uh, so beautifully described those letters. And uh, in addition to her book, she actually published a translation of all of those letters. And uh, those letters are really moving. I mean, uh, they are moving in particular in what uh, she writes to him. I mean, uh, you know, first of all, the respect with which she treats him. And, uh, but, but, you know, when she died, she died at, in her 30s. Um, this was a huge shock for Galileo. Uh, and he wrote to a friend that, you know, he had this daughter who was so smart and uh, so loving of him and and so on he was clearly devastated by her by her death um no question about that and she took care actually of of his villa and uh, of you know uh, the you mentioned the olive trees the olives and the wine and so on uh when he was uh, during this trial uh, so he was a very loving father the son because there was no issue of dowry with the son mm -hmm. uh, the son was eventually made legitimate by by the grand duke 
um, and he actually, uh, so he lived a, a rather peaceful life. Um, he was uh, near Galileo when he died. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, and uh, that's it. But, 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 but the life of the daughters was, was really tough. Yeah, I imagine that. I'm showing in the background of my video that I took from the uh, Italian, this is the uh, uh, University of, of, um, of Arcetri in, in outside of Florence. And you can see one of their teaching telescope domes. And even in the back, you can see another dome, uh, El Duomo in Florence down. Now, this is not far. They are the stewards of Galileo's villa. Uh, where he lived out the rest of his life uh, after this this imprisonment. I want to, uh, I know the video will probably get people to be nauseous, so I'm going to turn it back to a photo of the same area, which is much more bucolic and peaceful. Uh, again, this is Galileo's uh, final, final uh, resting place, final place where he did science. Here's a picture of the door, very imposing door, uh, wooden medieval looking door. It's uh, quite striking. Here's the a night shot of the of the um, of the uh, entryway seen from the courtyard. Here's the courtyard itself with a bunch of Italian physicists I know in the background uh, taking pictures. This is a panoramic view. Um, I want to finish up the discussion of the book with uh, the last book that Galileo ever wrote, and then I want to talk a little bit about books in general to you in the remaining few minutes. You have a few more minutes to go. Mario? Sure. Yes. Okay. Great. So. Um, when I read this book, and I finished, it finishes up with a discussion of the discorsi, which is uh, the discourse on two systems of the world, and, and you make the point what that really means, and I'll leave it to the reader to read what, what the interpretation of you know, these two systems, and he seemed to use this dialectic methodology quite a bit. Um, and it made me think of pedagogy today, and one of the things that took me, uh, struck me so powerfully from your last book, Why, What Makes Us Curious?, um, I'll put this up. I know uh, we'll feed it in there. It's kind of a view of it. Anyway, uh, we'll put up a link to it in the notes. But um, you make the case for and why for pedagogy in a way that really struck me as I was reading the book, uh, the new book, Galileo and the Science Deniers. And that's that. Um, and you're going to think this is crazy, but we should teach the controversy. You ever heard that phrase before? Teach the controversy, Mario? Well, I, I heard that, you know, usually news media, they like controversy. Yeah, I mean, it's usually in the context of creationists that say, oh, you should teach the contra that there is a controversy that uh, between Darwin, Darwin had these significant doubts and, and blah, blah, blah. And you should teach intelligent design on an equal footing with creationism. That's typically what they mean by that. I'm just being a little bit tongue in cheek here. What I mean is the controversy that uh, you really illuminate in the dial in the discourse. You talk about how Galileo used, say, inclined planes. Now, I don't know if you remember or how teaching was done for you when you where you grew up, but for me, when I was introduced to inclined planes and balls and things rolling down inclined, planes, it was the most stupefyingly boring, uh, you know, monotonous form of education. But then I started thinking about what you said in the book. Why, when you talk about, well, how do you teach the law of gravity to a young kid? You teach them, him or her, about the dinosaurs. You ask, how did the dinosaurs die? Well, they were hit by a huge asteroid. And then how did that asteroid get here? Well, it was attracted by gravity. And you don't start off with the inverse square law, right? Uh, and I started thinking, well, what if we taught physics majors, and especially non-majors? What if we said, here's this controversy, here's this book where these principles were laid out. And, uh, and it was the result of this book came about as a result of a huge controversy revolving around the very interpretation of, uh, of the word of God, if you will, and the word of science. And I wonder, um, you know, what do you think about like teaching as a teaching method uh, to make things more uh, visceral and to make children more curious and asking why? You know, what, you just start off, this book was written in prison, and, it, and uh, what we know about inclined planes was written by a man who was imprisoned at the time. I mean, what, don't you think that would pique their curiosity? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, certainly sort of a human story added to this, and, uh, and, and storytelling always, you know, works. I mean, uh, you're right that... Uh, you, you know, when I grew up, uh, we actually solved problems on inclined planes uh, to death uh, <laughs> when I studied physics. Still do. And, uh, and uh, it, it really, you know, I mean, 
you, you must have, you know, I, I, I remember I was thinking, you know, what, how many times am I going to use this inclined plane? And, you know, not once, I don't remember once somebody telling me, you know why we even talk about inclined planes? Because Galileo was really trying to study free fall. Yeah. But he had no good way to measure short times. So he had to slow motion, to, to, to slow the motion to a point where he could make more precise measurements. And he had this incredible idea of slowing down the motion by rolling balls down inclined planes at a very small angle, because that allowed him to measure the times better, you know, and, and, and so on. And not only that, he had this intuition that free fall can be seen as an extreme case of an inclined plane that is at 90 degrees, you know, to the ground. So nobody ever mentioned this to me when, when I studied these things. And I think that if you tell people that, you know, I think they get a better feeling of, you know, what kind of insights were involved in these inclined planes. Absolutely. And then my, uh, you know, my complimentary suggestion to what you're saying is also to teach a little bit of the history. You know, we, we always teach science as discoveries, you know, or punctuated by Nobel prizes and, and, uh, and attention, but we never really talk about the human beings behind these discoveries and how interesting would that be and make it much more visceral and likely for people to remember, you know, here I'm showing the picture of his villa where, you know, he might have been ruminating. I like to think about him walking around here and this is on the second floor and we uh, overlooking where the kitchen was, uh, the, the, you know, where they would eat uh, back then. Um, and I just think it's, it's so fascinating to think about how these arose from basically this, you know, ultimate um, controversy of all, which is, you know, how does the universe, how is the universe organized? Is it, is, does mankind play any sort of special role within it? Uh, and so it's, it's fascinating. I think it could combine your book, Why, with your book, uh, Galileo and the Science Deniers, to really stimulate curiosity in a way that's uh, uniquely, perhaps, well-suited to Galileo in particular. I want to finish up by um, a discussion of, uh, you know, kind of just a, a current event perhaps uh, involving uh, things in the news while we're doing this remotely instead of in person. We did an event about two years ago now with you in person here in San Diego. It's quite lovely to have you here. Um, so now, of course, we're all you know, shut down because of the COVID-19 uh, emergency that's going around the world. What can you say about that from the perspective of Galileo? Or what lessons would Galileo have to teach us about how to handle such things as this? Uh, you know, again... You, you already mentioned that phrase, which I mentioned in the book, which is believe in science. Uh, you know, we, we should have taken the advice of the scientists here from the beginning, and we should continue to follow them. I mean, look, let me just give you a very, very simple example. I mean, the, the task force that deals with, with the COVID-19 pandemic issued very, very clear guidelines to, you know, what should it take for uh, various states to open, you know, to reopen uh, businesses and things like that and so on. Very, very clear guidelines. And the guidelines say you should have 14 days of declining, you know, numbers of cases and new cases and all that, you know, and so on. And yet we are faced now with a situation which, you know, almost 20 states open without having that. That really means not following the science. Now, of course, I hope very much that nothing really bad will happen as a result of this. And of course, I realize that everybody wants to open. Yes, I mean, clearly, I mean, we're all stuck at home and not doing what what we want to do and what we can do. And there are people who are losing their businesses and there are people who hardly have even what to eat and so on. This is horrible. But those guidelines were put together by a bunch of scientists who sat down and really thought what it takes to actually overcome this pandemic. So you cannot just ignore that, you know, altogether. So I, I think Galileo would have been as terrified as I am from this type of, of reaction, uh, you know, because he would 
not understand why people are not following the advice of those who are experts in these types of things. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Uh, the last thing uh, related specifically to the book is uh, this famous motto, uh, and you can say it in Italian because I can't, uh, and yet it moves. Uh, can you say something about this unique kind of pursuit that you undertook in the writing of this book to understand how that phrase originated? First, say it in Italian, please. E pur si muove. E pur si muove. And what does yes. that mean? And what is the truth and the fiction surrounding well, the famous phrase? Well, I can tell you what it means. It means it, it, this was re referring to the earth, yes? Mm -hmm. And le legend has it that, uh, you know, after finishing everything and so on, he sort of muttered this phrase, and yet it moves, you know, and yet the earth moves. Uh, I took, uh, I, I did a whole year's of worth of research trying to find out the origin of this motto. And uh, I did find that out. Uh, now, I will not tell you what the result is here now. Uh, however, uh, on uh, May 5th, which is in a few days from today, uh, I published an article. Well, I, it will be published in Scientific American on the results of that, uh, of, of that motto. But look, irrespective of whether this is a myth or not, I mean, the motto has become, you know, like a symbol of intellectual defiance, basically saying, in spite of what you may believe, these are the facts. And, and, and as such, it applies to so many situations even today. Very good. So I like to finish up uh, the conversation with what I call the final five. Uh, and that involves the um, following questions that I like to start off, uh, just, or conclude most of my discussions with, and that involves uh, the meaning, first starting with the meaning of, of books in your life. And one thing I always like to, to kind of um, you know, present to other authors is what, uh, what your preference is. If you were to have somebody pick up this book 100 years from now, but it's just one reader, would you prefer that to, say, having 100 readers or 1,000 readers uh, one year from now? Okay, we all want a lot of book sales when the book first comes out, but I'm talking about the lasting impact. Is it more important to have the longevity or to have the breadth of influence of this book's ideas? Well, ideally, you would have both. Um, Can't say both. That's yeah, the... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but... Um... Do I want longevity or breadth now? Is that what you? Yeah. Asking? Would you rather have? Uh, let me just say. Would you rather have a hundred readers uh, w uh, one year from now, or one reader a hundred years from now? I see. Um, well, you know, books. Maybe this book is. Uh, maybe for this book, I would prefer longevity. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, for books in general, I mean, and especially books that are related to science, uh, they only have a certain length of lifetime. So, and, and after which they become sort of dated. Uh, I certainly hope that this one would not, but, mm. but generally books on science become dated. And so for those, certainly I would, you know, would want a, a, a very large readership now. Mm -hmm. uh, because they would become dated anyhow. So, yeah, along those lines, when I was reading your book, it reminded me I bought a copy of Galileo's uh, book on the military compass, uh, which is, you know, perhaps in some sense is one of his rarest books of all those books, even though obviously the Siderius Nuncius and the Dialogo were, were banned um, during the, in, um, the index of prohibited books. But I started reading, there's an English translation you can get. It's beautiful. It has the Italian, um, actually the Latin, I think it's the Latin. I don't remember if he was writing in Italian back then. I know the Siderius Nuncius is in, is in Latin, and then the Dialogo famously was in Italian. But anyway, yeah. I'm reading the English translation uh, because I don't uh, speak Italian or Latin, and I came across a passage where Galileo is talking about um, this use of the military compass in what we would call nowadays currency conversions. In other words, you want to convert uh, euros to dollars. Uh, this way of manipulating the compass could be used to do that. 
And it's really just a matter of a scale factor, what we call a scale factor now. Uh, but the example that he uses, I think, is he talks about converting, um, uh, you know, scuti to Ducati. Scudi. Scudi. Scudi to Ducati. Yeah. And yeah. I started thinking, like, if you could find a, uh, a Scudi today, uh, you know, it might be worth a little bit. I mean, you can find Roman coins, you know, from 2,000 years ago and buy them for a couple of dollars at an antique show. So certainly one Scudi is not worth that much. Um, but then you look at the prices of a Galileo uh, compass. If he had just kept the compass book, the first editions were, you know, is almost, uh, you know, priceless. Well, yeah, well, because you only printed like 60 copies or something of that book. Yeah, so, yeah. and they start to deteriorate. So I just thought it was cute that he has this book that's 420 years old, uh, basically. And uh, the currency conversions, if he had done them or left it to his son, Vincenzo, and his daughter, uh, who survived, perhaps. Well, she was a nun, so she didn't have any any progeny one expects. I want to talk one more question. No, to and you she about, died before him. So uh, uh, I didn't mean Celeste, the other one. Oh, oh okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the other question around, about books is what would you like your target audience to be? Would you rather have it be people that are, you know, kind of uh, fanatical supporters of Galileo? Or would you rather have it be science deniers themselves? Well, uh, again, I, I would like it to be both, to be honest. But uh, I, I will tell you something. I mean, I, I've seen many studies which show that once adult people are convinced of something, uh, it is virtually impossible to change their opinions, uh, even if you show them facts. Um, and and so in this case, I, I wouldn't say supporters of Galileo, but I, I would say I would like every sort of educated person, you know, to, to, to read this book. Um, uh, concerning the issue of how do you change opinions, uh, I think there is no escape from doing that from very early on, namely the education system for, for children. Because once they become adults and have strong opinions, it turns out it's very, very difficult to change those. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay, just a couple more questions. Um, one now I'll turn to involves uh, what you're optimistic about uh, in the future and what you might be a little more pessimistic about uh, coming about in the near future, but either scientifically, politically, culturally, what have you. Um, I think, you know, one thing that, uh, you know, I would say almost keeps me up at night um, is inequality. Mm. Uh, inequality, I, I see that as one of the biggest problem that that you know our world is facing, uh, because we, you have these places, you know, you live in San Diego. Uh, there is a, you know, just south of you, there is a border with Central America, and there is a huge disparity on the two sides of that border. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, if you look between uh, Europe and Africa, you know, the Mediterranean, there is a huge disparity on both sides of that border. Uh, there used to be a huge disparity between Western and Eastern Europe. It's somewhat less now, but still there is a big disparity. And those things are, are very problematic. And I, I honestly don't even know of good solutions for them. Uh, but I see the, those things as, as being a serious problem. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, there are things like climate change that worry me. I mean, people, we, we do need to do something about this. There is no question in my mind. And we need to do this. What am I optimistic about? Um, you know, I, I, I do feel, you know, even now at these horrible times of, of COVID-19, mm. uh, you, you, you do see... Uh, here and there, you see the goodness of people coming out. Um, you, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. when I do my short walks around the house now and with a mask and other people go, you know, we all say hello to each other, you know, people that I don't even know who they are. Um, and, uh, and, and, and you see, you know, people who try to support others and, and, and things like this, and you see lots of acts of kindness to in, in very many places. Uh, that somehow, you know, gives you the, the, the hope that maybe there is, that, that maybe there is hope mm. uh, <laughs> to humans. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. Uh, on, on the scientific 
part, uh, I always hoped that during my lifetime, we would find life elsewhere. Uh, and we haven't yet. Uh, and uh, I am now not young anymore, so I don't know if I will live to see it. I, I actually believe that within 20 to 30 years, we will either find life elsewhere, or at least we will have some meaningful constraint about how rare life mm. is in the galaxy. Yeah, uh, But mm -hmm. the problem is that I'm not sure that I will live 20 to 30 more years, so I may miss on, on that. Yeah. So the last question really involves uh, something that uh, is close to our hearts here at the Arthur C. Clarke Center. You might be familiar with uh, Sir Arthur C. Clarke's uh, famous three laws uh, of, of uh, culture, science, society, what have you. His, his first law being that, uh, that the, there's um, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. That's his second, his first law. His third law is, um, <clears throat> uh, is that for every expert, there's an equal and opposite expert, or something that Isaac Newton would uh, put into place later on, uh, thanks to the work of, the, of Galileo, as you point out in the book. But his second law is the one that our podcast name is taken from, and that's the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little way past them into the impossible. And I'm wondering what about your life, your work, seemed impossible maybe as a young person in your 30s or 40s that now seems possible because you did venture a little bit beyond your comfort zone into what we call the impossible? Um, you know, I, I'm not sure. I mean, life has changed so much and technology is, in particular has changed so much mm. that I'm convinced that many things that today we take for granted, I saw as absolutely impossible when I was a child. I mean, you know, to have a, to be able to to do this conversation now in the way we do it, mm -hmm. you know, I could not have dreamt that this is how we would do it. I still remember that as a child, we were always told that one day people will be able to talk on the phone and actually see the person that they are talking to. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I thought, whoa, wow, will I ever see that? <laughs> <laughs> and now we're doing it live. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I, I'm not sure exactly what I did, which, which was impossible. I mean, I think that society as a whole did many things that looked impossible. Um, and uh, we benefit from that. Um, AI probably will be the impossible of the relatively near future, I think. You know, mm -hmm. uh, big advances in AI, I think, you know, mm -hmm. uh, to the point maybe even that they become the dominant uh, intelligent civilization. Mm. Well, that'll be a topic uh, uh, for another time. Mary, I want to thank you so much, Dr. Mary Olivio, author of uh, Galileo and the Science Deniers, a wonderful new book that I had an opportunity to read and uh, will listen to when it's out on audiobook on May 5th. And we'll try to have this up as well as links to your other things. Where can people find out more about you online and what's your next project? Uh, well, more about me online. Uh, there is, uh, I have a website which is mario-livio.com. Not to be confused with a website which I don't conduct, which is called mariolivio.com without the dash. Right. Uh, that is written by a person that I don't know at all. <laughs> you just drove a lot of traffic to that site because people are going to want to see what it is. I'll save you the trouble. It's not worth visiting. <laughs> so it's mario-livio.com. That's my actual website. And my next project, well, I, of course, started thinking about the next book, but I don't like to talk about this before. You know, I, I really know that that's a book I want to yeah, write. Yeah, I understand. And I'll remind people they can find uh, Dr. Mario Livio at Mario dash Livio or Mario underscore Livio uh, on Twitter. And uh, he tweets uh, quite uh, quite frequently. And it's always quite interesting to see his, uh, his punditry about all the issues of the day and issues of many centuries ago in the Galileo and the Science Deniers. Mario, thank you so much. It's been a real treat as usual. I hope we can see each other in the coming uh, months in person. Thank you very much. And Stay I well. hope so too. Stay well.
only thing we can be sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. Five, four, three, two, one.